So, the premise of this talk, diet change is essential for a habitable planet and it's no longer a, per a matter of personal preference. If you look at how we use planet Earth, this is, this is it. This is the latest. Um, this big chunk is pasture. It's the biggest land use of all on planet Earth. The next is forests. Most of it is degraded. Most of it is suffering, but 15% of it is still intact. Then there's cropland and there's other bare uh, minimal use, ice, snow, deserts. But if you look at the land that we humans use, how is that used? Okay, this, without all those unused areas, this is human used land. This is pasture, this is the forest that we harvest, this is feed crops that we feed to animals, this is food crops that we eat, this is biofuel and other, like, like cotton, uh, and this is settlement. So if you, if you think, if you drive along and you see expansion of suburbs and you think, oh no, we're trashing the environment, it's tiny compared with the, um, the, the land use for feeding cattle. Okay, in 2016, uh, a, a paper out of North America found that the land use that we use per person depends very much on what we eat. This is the, um, the baseline, the, the, the standard North American diet, the average North American diet. This is the um, positive, this is um, healthy diet, low sugar, low fat, very close to that. And this is omni, eating everything, 100% meat eating down to 20%. So you can see this drops straight away. Over vegetarian, lacto vegetarian and vegan. So the vegan diet requires 0.13 hectares per person to support that diet. The standard North American diet requires over a hectare per person to support that diet. So the single greatest thing you can do to reduce your footprint is what you eat. Deforestation, there it goes. This is Argentina from Greenpeace. This is, uh, they chain pull this, like we saw the chain pulling in Queensland. Then they go push it together and burn it. They don't use any of the timber. And then they plough it and they, this is actually uh, planting for uh, soybeans here. The, the, the big growth industry right now that, that in fact drives global trade in agricultural goods is, is um, animal feed. China's, China has enough food to feed its people but not enough feed to feed its growing pig population. Europe's the same. So um, this feed's got to come from somewhere. So South America is the big centre. Um, tropical forests are being destroyed at 130,000 kilometres. 85% of forests are now gone, degraded or fragmented. 85%. One fifth of the emissions come from deforestation. Some predict that the planetary boundaries for deforestation will be exceeded in the, within the next 5, 10, 15 years and we'll hit the ecological footprint boundary by 2050. Once we hit the ecological boundary, we, we experience an ecological collapse. So, <laughs> game over. What's causing it? Have a look at this, isn't this amazing? This is in the south of Brazil. This is the Cerrado, subtropical forest that cleared for, white, by, for soybean production and corn production. Have you ever seen so many harvesters <laughs> in one sway? That's incredible. Okay, so the, the survey of not just Brazil, but the rest of South America, 85% is for, of, of deforestation. The world's centre for deforestation is South America. 85% is for pasture and livestock feed. Um, Indonesia, they've done a survey for the first time, came out this year, 
Indonesia is really hard because it's, it's covered with cloud all the time. So to get remote sensing, to get mapping data is really difficult. But they've done it on a small sample and they found 23% for palm oil. That's the common belief that palm oil drives deforestation in Indonesia. And 20% is for pasture. So um, a, a quarter of it nearly is palm oil and about a fifth of it is for pasture. The rest is small crops. So contrary to popular belief, logging does not kill forests. Food kills forests. And the way they do it, and the way it's done globally is with fire. Okay, if you if you were to come along and and and, and take out and log a forest, even if you clear fell it, leave nothing standing. If you left that alone, it would regrow into forest. But they don't leave it alone; they burn it. We do the same in in Australia. These red these red spots are forest fires. Sorry, grazing pasture fires. That's how we control the old dead grass in the dry season and that's how we stop the trees, those pesky woody weeds from coming back. It's done globally. Africa is the, the fire central but South America as well and they're doing it in Australia as well. We burn, we stick rake, we push it together, we burn again and then we change the land use. So if you want to know what causes deforestation you look at the land use that that happens after it. So I saw this um, cartoon just recently about, and I thought it fits deforestation pretty well. Yeah, we can't eat money. So how do we stop deforestation? Well, watch says we change our diet. And so a lot of work's come out now about reforestation. And that is if we, and one of them is, if we return 41% of pastures, the bits that were forested, if we return them to forest, we'll draw down 27 years of current emissions. Isn't that amazing? We can, we can pull down, draw down from the atmosphere, almost three decades of emissions just by reforesting less than half of the current world's pastures. This, folks, is the saviour that's going to save us from the climate crisis. And there's a lot of organisations behind that, including World Preservation Foundation, and we'll talk about that. OK, biodiversity loss is the, is the big one that uh, they're, they're most concerned about. The, if you read the science, if you read these papers, Normally scientists talk in fairly muted terms. They give general um, uh, conclusions. They talk in, in fairly staid terms. But the sort of language that's coming out now from the ecologists about biodiversity loss is amazing. Humans are responsible. The sixth mass extinction is already here and the window for effective action is very short. This is almost sensational language for a science journal. It's amazing. Um, and that's how we change. We burn, baby, burn. So how have we changed planet Earth? This is incredible. Of the mammals now on the planet, just 4% are wildlife. 96% of the mammals on planet Earth are livestock and humans. How is this possible? This has been made possible by the Green Revolution. Nitrogen pollution is a big part of this. Nitrogen and protein are a big story that we might get into. 30% of birds now are wild, but... Um, I think that should be, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> there's more chickens than anything else on earth. Okay, so agriculture is the greatest driver of species loss. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, agriculture is the big driver of deforestation, therefore it's species loss. By the way, it's not feral cats, it's cows, it's sheep. It's feed for pigs and chickens. 
deforestation 10 kil in Queensland, 10 square kilometres a day, 2 kilometres by 5 kilometres every day. How many feral cats would it take to wipe out that? Uh, they, these wildlife, they don't just fly off and find a new home somewhere. Their home's gone. They're gone. So let's get these things in perspective. Meat is the biggest threat to wildlife. There's a mountain of information on that now. A few years ago, 10 years ago, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency did a survey about biodiversity loss, and they looked at what can we do? And they found that the most effective was change in diet. Um, a, a diet change to vegan would prevent 60% of biodiversity loss. They looked at doubling the area of national parks and reserves, and that was way less effective. They looked at a lot of other measures, but the number one measure was diet change. Protein pollution, this is nitrogen, this is a fascinating story. When you, when you test for, for protein content, you test for nitrogen. The amount of nitrogen in the food tells you how much protein is in the food. So what we've done, we incredibly inventive humans, we've created this Haber-Bosch process that um, has created, out of thin air, has created nitrogen fertiliser. In fact, that's what we do, we pull it out of thin air and we create nitrogen fertiliser. This has, has enabled the green revolution. We've spread this nitrogen fertiliser on all these crops and we, they grow like crazy because they have the nutrient. But the trouble is, we're now producing as much nitrogen through this chemical process as the whole of nature does in the natural biological processes from the soil organisms right up. So we have flooded the world with nitrogen. We have flooded the world with protein. And where does that go? into lagoons, <laughs> into waterways. And when it rains and when it pours and when these things escape or they into the groundwater as well, it creates, it's, it's considered the greatest cause of water and air pollution globally. It's a big issue. When you grow a plant, only 30 to 40 percent of the nitrogen the fertilizer is taken up. When we eat livestock, for example, when we eat beef, we ingest only 4% of the nitrogen, of the, of the protein, that the, the cow ate. The rest is waste. So it goes into the waterways, it creates algal blooms. The al algae love this stuff and they just bloom and they blossom and they, and they blossom so much that they die. And as they die and sink to the bottom of the water, they suck all the oxygen out of the water. So we end up in waterways that are toxic. And the experts are telling us we must cut nitrogen pollution by half or suffer toxic tides, lifeless rivers and dead oceans. Eventually this ends up in the, in the ocean and creates ocean dead zones. There's now three to 400 permanent ocean dead zones. The Gulf of Mexico is a big one with the Mississippi River coming down, all that agricultural areas. So the recommendations now is that we cut down our meat by half if we're going to survive the protein pollution problem. Okay, land degradation and desertification. This is also dire. 60% of the land is degraded, 25% is highly degraded. We lose 20,000 square kilometres each year to erosion and we abandon cropland. This is amazing stuff. Half of the world's soils are now gone. And it's predicted that we just have 60 years left of farming, the way we do it now. And then the soils will be exhausted. 
down there where I am, um, northern New South Wales, they have places like Cudgeon, which have beautiful, rich, red soil. And you look at this soil and you think, wow, this lovely soil. But I was talking to one of the producers there. She has an organic farm and she shakes her head. She, she looks at the farms next door and they're basically sweet potato farms. And she says, you know, they run the tractor and the plow over this land 20 times to break up the clods. What that's doing is destroying the soil structure. It's destroying the soil biota. It's destroying the health of the soil. She said that the only thing that they can grow in that soil now is sweet potatoes. It looks so good, but it's useless for anything but sweet potatoes. And the only way they get them to, to grow is they pour on the fertilizer. That's exactly what we're doing globally. I saw a talk at World Environment Day a few years back. This, this guy, this soil science expert from uh, Lismore, and he brought in these Tupperware containers. And, the, and the, the first one, he said, this is soil. And it's rich and dark and really lots of things growing in it. And the next one, he said, this is a bit degraded. And the one at the other end, he said, this is dirt. Looked like sand. He said, we're turning soil into dirt. It's exactly what's happening using industrial farming the way we do it now. We've got to change. We've got to go organic or agroecological. Because if we don't change, well, it's essential because we won't be able to farm the way we do in 60 years' time. We'll have exhausted it. What causes that overgrazing deforestation agricultural practice? What causes that? Diet. <laughs> Water. By 2030, we'll need 40% more water in the world. Over half of the world's largest aquifers are threatened. We see it now, the Murray-Darling Basin. It's global. This is a map of the water stress by country. It's not just happening in, our, in Australia, it's global. What do we use that water for? Three quarters of it for irrigation, more in developing countries. What happens if there's not enough water? We have climate refugees. Look at Syria. The Fertile Crescent, Syria included, had the millennium drought. A lot of the farmers on the land, you can suffer one year of drought maybe two years of drought, maybe three years of drought. But when you get five years of drought and you've got nothing left, what do you do? Put yourself in that position. You can't feed the family. You've got nothing, no government support. So what do you do? You up and walk. They walk to the cities. What happens there? You have conflicts between the Shiites and the Sunnis. You can't stay there. What do you do? You walk to Europe. You get on a boat. Refugees are the most visible sign of water stress, of climate change, and that is what's going to reshape the world in the future because this is going to get worse.